I would like to begin with what I think is um, a beautiful trajectory in terms of your journey and where you've been. Uh, I read, you know, that you've had, we all have different lives, but I read that you were a model. Um, so can we begin, can we begin with growing up in Nashville, living mm -hmm. this life and, and clearly always tall and beautiful and present? Um, can Not you, always, but okay. okay. <laughs> 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 can can you talk to me about growing up in Nashville and and what you think in your opinion when you look back on your life growing up there fed you into being in this world that we live today? Um well so I grew up in Nashville. I was born in 1964 and I say that cuz it was such a different time. And um I was I was painfully shy. And, um, I went to my first Broadway play when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, around 11 years old. And that had such an impact on me that I had memorized some of these lines and I went home and I'm like reciting them to my mom and like for a month. And, um, she was telling some of her friends about this and they're like, put that girl into theater. And so I think um, up to that point, I was so shy. I played basketball because I'm tall, but I'm also very, at the time, I was very lanky and goofy, but I went to a Catholic school. And so I had known these, these girls, like, you know, since they were five. So they're not going to tell me you can't play basketball. I mean, I was the person that they put in if you're 50 points ahead and there's a minute left. Okay, we can put Carla in because she's not going to mess up the game. <laughs> so, I mean, I was like that person, really kind of goofy, and I would hyperventilate when I, had, when I worked out too much. I mean, you know, really a hot mess. But theater was the thing that I think um, sort of saved me from being bullied because – you know, in theater, they're like, dare to be you, dare to be different. It's okay if somebody calls you weird. You know, I learned to say, oh, thank you, because that's that's like a badge of honor in the theater world to not be like everyone else. And so my mom put me in theater at um, 12, and then I started Take, I was taking classes from 12 to 17, from, se from 12 to 17, I was taking acting classes, and I really thought that that's what I was going to do. Um <clears throat> I wanted to go to Boston University because our my drama teacher had her kids in at Boston University. Some of my friends went to Boston University. That was the only school that I had my eyes on. That was the only conservatory that I auditioned for because I just knew they were going to accept me. And then they didn't. And I was crushed. I was crushed. They were going to defer my admissions. And I'm like, what? All I saw was... Um, uh, like a um a gut punch of just you know not favoring me um and so i decided to go to howard because my sister was going there again i only applied to howard after this i was like oh i guess i'll go to howard not even thinking about in hindsight all of the people who went to the fine arts program like the theater school at howard you know that i see now um but my acting teacher was from New York. She knew, um, she knew Boston university. So my rejection from Boston university didn't carry on to say, Oh, well maybe you can do the, the fine arts at Howard. So I didn't. So I made an about face and did accounting as one would do because I hey. liked my accounting teacher. <laughs> I mean, acting, <laughs> accounting, all the same in the same, <laughs> on the same family. Um, I read that you quit after a couple of years because you hated it and you yeah. were like, what's next? You went to model. How do we say, you know what, later for accounting, I'm going to go model. Well, it, it was because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And modeling was a brand, uh, was sort of a bridge between what I knew I didn't want to do, which was accounting and what I eventually wanted to do. And if you know anything about Howard University, our fashion shows are epic. And I started modeling um, at Howard for those fashion shows. And then when I went to Tampa and somebody came up to me, do you model? I'm like, well, I modeled in college. And so I started modeling as a way to meet people, but it wasn't a dream of mine. Then I hated my job. Honestly, I was afraid of being 40 and hating my job. That was my biggest fear. So, um, some girls were like going to Paris and they were like, Oh, we're going to Paris to model. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. So that's what I did. I, I mean, 
and it, what's so interesting as I, as I think about it, I didn't have a plan. I wasn't running towards something. I was running away from something, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when you find your plans, right? How great is that? Yeah. I, how beautiful it is to say, well, y'all going to, all right, let me go to Paris is by the way, my favorite city, but to go there at an age that you, to me, that's the dream. Like if I could do it all over again, I'd go live in Paris, not to model, but just to live in Paris or over mm -hmm. in Europe when you're young and you're just figuring it out. And then you come back and figure and say, okay, I'll try something else now. I would love that. What was that experience like? Like what did it change about you and your person? I think, you know, there's a sense of independence. My mother let me go. Uh, she probably didn't think it was going to last, you know, me being in Paris, then London for two years. Um, you know, I went there by myself with one telephone number of a, of a woman, a model who was there that I hadn't even met. And so it's a sense of discovery and independence um, that I didn't realize. I, I, I when I left there and I was going to Germany, I was going to Italy, I can navigate my way through a foreign city, an airport with just a map that I know that about myself. I, I am pretty much independent. And so um, that's what it gave me a sense of who I am, how to get on with people. I don't know how to navigate a strange city um, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at that. And that, yes. Yeah. So, but tell me, okay. Like realistically back then, if you don't mind me asking, cause mm -hmm. when you, that sounds glamorous, but then I remember Tyra Banks when she had the top model show, she was like, I don't want to be a poor runway model. What were you making? Like per show? Like, how did you start? I was a poor runway model. <laughs> and what does that mean? Like, are they giving you a hundred bucks a show when you're just hustling for work? What are you doing? So what, let, so let me put, let me, let me put you into that space. So first of all, it's just as hard to get, to find an agency who will represent you so that you know where to go to get those castings as it is to actually get the job. Right. Um, so Tyra was, I think Tyra had a completely different experience than I did. Um, Tyra was probably plucked out of obscurity. And so she had agents in New York. She had agents in, um, France, she, you know, so she had, she had agents who were taking care of her. Maybe Tyra also had an apartment that was given to her or paid for by her agents. I didn't have that. Um, I was also, I think I was older than she would have been when she started. I, so I had been to college. I was 21, 22, about 22, 22, 23. Mind you, um, because I had started in accounting and, and this was a bridge, I wanted to complete the CPA exam. So I was studying for the CPA exam while I was in France, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I still, because for me, that was a, a box checked of something that I had accomplished that I didn't want to leave dangling and unfinished. So, um, so once I got an agency, then you have to get pictures. I'm, I'm forced into this world. I'm, I'm still trying to um, find myself. So you have the agent, the agency. They give you um, during the season. So you have the ready-to-wear season, pret-to-porter, and then you have the haute couture season. The, the ready-to-wear is casual. You're going. There are a lot more shows. Um, it's sort of like um, Fashion Week in New York. Sure. You are, you have a list of, let's say 10 places to go and see, and you have a, a map and you have a list of people to go see with an address. And it's up to you to find your way to those places by yourself. And it's almost like you see all of these models. And at the time, all wearing black, all of their hair snatched back. I remember how somebody said, you need to learn how to tame those edges because right here, I was wearing contacts at the time, never glasses, needless to say, but she's like, your edges aren't really nice and laid down. So mm -hmm. the bun, like the low chignon, the mm -hmm. hair snatched back, um, black pants, black top, looking very svelte. Um, and that's how we showed up at these castings. They would look through your book. They're like, mm, thanks. I mean, you know, a lot of times. Well, Paris like, is so nonchalant out. too, though, right? Like they're just yes. so, uh, the whole time. <laughs> the whole time. Girl, let me no. tell you, the, so uh. the first day I was there, mm -hmm. um, before I even called my friend Rosalind Johnson, I, um, I went downstairs and I'm staying at a pensione, um, fifth floor. There's a, there's a 
slanted roof. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm almost six feet tall and I'm having to cock my head to the side just so I don't hit my head. And I go downstairs to order some food. I don't really know French. I took like a month of French before I left home. And I'm at this um, patisserie and I'm like, en croissant du beurre, s'il vous plaît. Uh -uh. <laughs> en croissant du beurre. <laughs> and I, I, I'm like, okay, I did theater. Let me, let me mimic her. En croissant du beurre, s'il vous plaît. Ah, 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 ah. Croissant du beurre. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to starve here. <laughs> I cannot order my food. Um, and so I was like, oh. en croissant. And I, with the mouth and everything, I was like, du beurre. Oh. And she's like, ah, okay. <sighs> Oh, you know what? Uh, can I tell you something? They get on my nerves with that shit. I, 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 I swear I was there. By the way, it's funny. I'm laughing. I was there with my friend and this heifer had the nerve and she's like my big sister. So I consider her much more elegant. She's been to Paris a bunch. She just bought a Chanel purse. We're sitting down after she buys, buys her very first Chanel purse because that's what you do in Paris. This is some real high level shit. I'm saying to you guys, please forgive us. We're bougie. But she sits at this cafe and she orders a steak and she orders it one. Well done. They could have kicked her out. Two, she asked for ketchup. The man started oh! to he was like, ba -da -ba -ba -ba. is this McDonald's? I'm loving it. He told her this is not McDonald's and you cannot have ketchup with your steak or your fries. He told her, no. I was like, yo, they are so dead set about their ways in this place. For them to not want to give you that food. And even then, I've never had that happen to me. I think they realize Americans, how they make their money. They can't, they can't just dismiss us because they have to make some money. But I could imagine, you know, you being a young girl and they'd be like, mm, no croissant for you walking in some little tiny cafe. Nothing for you. Nothing yes. for you, lady. So, and I don't know when you went. So this was 1989 and they were very, I think, snobby about not knowing the language right but yes. i i also had to make my money stretch so i was not buying a chanel purse as a matter of fact <laughs> um, my, no <laughs> this was recently that. i was like this okay. was recently, like within the last like you know i i work for the tennis channel so i used to go every year to cover the french open but this was recently maybe not not recently it was like 2015 or something like that that's recent yeah okay <laughs> I mean, that's recent. So when I was there, my girlfriend and a guy, we had gotten this paper and we were like, okay, where are the inexpensive places to eat? So we're going through this list and we found this place. We're like, oh my gosh, it's only five francs. We are totally going. We get there. It's basically a soup kitchen. We That's where we were. I, I just tell you the difference. You like, girl, I was, I, back to the original question. I was a poor <laughs> runway model. Don't talk to me about your Chanel purses. Okay, wait. So how long did you live in Paris and London? And from my understanding, I believe Milan for a while. How long were you over there? Yes. So I was there back and forth. Um, so I was going for the season. So I was there for back and forth for a year. So I would go there for the season. And then I would come back and I would try to pick up, um, showroom work in New York. And, um, I worked for Yoli, which is a designer in New York and just going back and forth. And then you would go, I would go to Milan for the season. I happened to be in Florence. I mean, I, girl, I have stories. I remember, so this was also back in the day, when you know we didn't have the the roller bags you, mm -hmm. you you didn't have that you had to oh. put a suitcase on a contraption that opened up like a dolly that you would put your suitcase on right i didn't have that either so when i had these big heavy bags i would have to take out like some socks and put it under on my shoulder under the strap of the bag and carry my thing that's what i was doing i just want to set the picture of how this was not glamorous, okay? <laughs> Wait, so as a model, you would put socks under oh, underneath the strap of the bag because it was so heavy to help your shoulder. Correct, when I was traveling from city to city. This is what I was oh. doing. When I would come it's back into a city like the States, my friends didn't know how I was coming to visit. I could be on a bus. I could be on a train. I could be maybe on a plane if it was internationally. But I, I'm just telling you, that's that was my reality at the time. Okay, but it sounds so romantic when I read it on your resume. Was it not a wonderful time? You know what was wonderful? Um, so there was a woman named, um, oh my gosh, Evans, Evans, Evans. Elaine, there was a woman named Elaine Evans from 
from Memphis, Tennessee. And she would invite a bunch of models over to her house. And it was a bunch of um, um, black models who were living there. Um, I mentioned my friend, Rosalind. She's from New Jersey. There was a woman named Sherry from New Jersey. All of these models, like from the, the New York area. And we would go there and have these brunches, right? Which was very similar to the Sunday suppers that I had at my grandmother's house. And Elaine was such a great cook. Um, interestingly enough, she was a great cook. And I found out later that Jessica Harris, Dr. Jessica B. Harris of High on the Hog, that's on Netflix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jessica Harris taught Elaine Evans how to cook. <gasps> so by the time, right. I mean, the it, what? Are you kidding me? Like, so by the time I saw Elaine, Elaine was this amazing cook. And when I'm telling Jessica this story, she's like, wait, Elaine Evans from, That's crazy. from uh, Memphis. I oh taught God. Elaine how to cook. I'm like, you are kidding me. It was just that so just crazy. That just gave me chills because you know what? It's all meant to be. It is that, those are these moments in life, guys, if you're listening, where you know God has you exactly where you're supposed to be or had yes. you where you're supposed to be. Like, it's all so ordered and destined. Oh, my God. That's so wonderful. Yes. So we were having <clears throat> these amazing brunches and um, where well, we would make uh, buffalo wings um, macaroni and cheese. Elaine would try to get to the farmer's market early because there were turnips, but they would throw away the turnip greens so we can make greens. Like, I mean, that, that was, uh, my world. And so in that respect, it did feel glamorous. It felt like here I am, you know, having this amazing meals with these beautiful women, you know, at a gorgeous, um, Parisian apartment. And, and then the conversation came up about, oh, you know, everybody's debating back and forth. Well, my mother does macaroni and cheese like this. Well, my mother does it like this. Girl, I, I am about 23 at the time. I, I would eat macaroni and cheese, what, once a week. We never had it more than that on Sundays. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea. I said, I have no idea how this dish is made. Mm. None. Isn't that interesting and full circle? Look at you. Of yeah. all of the chefs, you are arguably the most known. I love to hear that because there are all these moments in your life that you can think about that led up to where you are right now, your complete yeah. trajectory. And that is really one of these moments, like the alchemy of it all. Oh, speaking of, did you, did I just say that? And I, you I, said I alchemy. Mean, I know. And I wasn't even ready to go to Alchemy Catering, caterers. I wasn't ready to do that yet, but it was so beautiful. Carrie, let's talk about that with this beautiful Carla Hall. Okay, wait. <laughs> so you didn't even know what was made. You guys, listen, she didn't even know what was in the mac and cheese that her mom made on Sundays while everybody was explaining the recipes. And mac and cheese is very serious in a black household. You guys know that. Mm -hmm. Um but you, you come back and I'm, I'm doing a little truncated version here. You, you mm -hmm. come back from being a model and how do you, I know that you got started in cooking and the fact that you brought, at least according to Wiki and other research we've done, you can please clarify, you maybe brought some sandwiches, leftover sandwiches to a, to a friend's job and people were like, have her come back and you realize you were a hit. I'm sure there were more, it was more moments than that. People kept telling yeah. you you can cook well, but tell me how you started actually getting into the idea of, wait, maybe I should be doing this for a living. I should be a chef. I should be cooking. I should be working in catering. I should be doing something of that nature. Well, I was still in the bridge. I was still on the bridge trying to figure out what was next. Um, and, and, and there's a pattern with me. I, I take clues from the universe very well, but clues of where I'm supposed to be in the moment. <clears throat> Um, that aren't very, and also I'm a quick start. So some, some, I have an idea. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. I don't, I don't, I don't get, uh, analysis paralysis. I'm like, all right, that sounds good. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so, Same. you know, I started that lunch delivery service just like that. And the next thing I knew, I had been working and doing it for five years. I had worked every single day for five years before I went to culinary school. And um, so, when, what, so when I went to culinary school, it was, and then that's when it took five years to say, wait a minute, I really, I really like this. I really want to do this. I really want to bet on myself and mm. do this for a living. It, but it took five years of just working every day. But in those five years, as hard as it was, I enjoyed 
taking food to people. What started out as an act of gratitude in all the different places I lived turned into a, a way of nurturing people. Mm. Right. How did so, you know that? How did you know you were well, nurturing people? I didn't have children. Um, I got to know all of my clients. I knew their likes, their dislikes. I knew I'm like, well, I would make things for them. Like, what is your favorite? I would go to your office and say, Hey, what is your favorite? And then when we had special meals on Fridays, the next thing I was making that favorite thing for them. Maybe it was lasagna. Maybe it was a chicken pot pie. Maybe it was a calzone. And when I made calzones, I was making the crust. I was making the filling. And then I would, I mean, my, my business was highly illegal. I was cooking out of my house, had no permits, but, um, that's it not the point. was amazing. <laughs> Cause you did it. <laughs> Cause I did it. Hey guys, do something illegal until it can be legal. <laughs> um, but I mean, that was also way back in the day. Um, and it was, so I felt like this need to take care of my, my, my clients and this community. And I pr primarily, I was working in DC in a black neighborhood. Um, I started on Kennedy street, door to door, hair salons, barbershops, um, you know, doctor's offices, and then uh, social services where they would send me to another place. And those people would send me to another place. Um, so it was this community that I felt like I was the glue and connecting all of these people. And it was, it was amazing. And, and I think the, the, the one time in particular, this woman wanted to, um, buy one of my dishes. And I said, Oh, I don't think you're going to like it because you don't like cilantro. And she looked at me and she said, Oh, do you remember that? I'm like, of course I remember, but I do think you would like this. Right. So it was all of that, like the, how someone felt when they knew that I saw them. Mm. It was healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Actually food is very healing in the sense that um, it can be comforting in good ways and on most ways, like food is comforting. Like when you need it, you need it. I was sick, uh, you know, I had a cold, no, no COVID. And I felt like I was eating my way through it. And you got to yeah. say that now. You can't just a say girl, it. Girl, you have to say it. You cough. I've been coughing for decades and people are like, oh my God, you got coughing. You, you got COVID. I've been coughing for years. You can't, got <laughs> you cannot cough on earth. Do not, <laughs> when I tell you, I, I am, I, I, when I cough, I know I'm like, no COVID. I'm so sorry, but you can't even clear your throat without somebody looking at you like you're crazy. Oh, 100, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just tell you, going off, <laughs> off on a tangent. So mm -hmm. I, I try to maintain my health and stamina so that I can run to a plane, a bus or whatever. A train, <laughs> right? I, I, I mean, that that's my bar, right? I need uh -huh, to be uh -huh. able to run to make a train. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. when I am running to make uh, my Amtrak train and I get there and I have uh, exercise induced asthma, Mm -hmm. because I have been running and I'm getting there coughing and everything. And I'm just looking at the person next to me. I'm like, I'm not germy. It is um, exercise induced asthma because I've been running for the train. <laughs> then I get really chatty and they're just looking at me like, shut the hell up. But I, I get it. No, I, well, first of all, I know speaking, we're going to stay on this tangent. You have the recess, which I love that you just that you do. Uh, I don't know if you still do that every day at 11 a.m. Eastern, because that to me seems very difficult to maintain, especially when you have a work schedule. But I happen to watch a couple of them, and one of which you were like, "I got, I got to work today. Hair and makeup on their way." But let me show you. I'm gonna put these, <laughs> put these hula hoops down here, and we're gonna hula hoop our way, and just change your mood because you're right. Exercise does, or any kind of movement changes your mood. But the idea yeah. of full blown exercise could turn people off. So I get it. So like, by the way, you inspired me. I was like, maybe I just need a hula hoop, you know, because my trainer get on my nerve. I don't feel like doing that when I see him. I'm like, I really don't want to see you today. I, I really don't want to do this. I'm I don't. But I would love to. I'd be motivated to get out of the house to hula hoop. Right. Back. Right. Shake your booty, change yeah. your moody. That's yeah. what I was saying. Right. I, but I love hula hoop. So during that time, it was during uh, the shutdown. Uh huh. And I, people were really stressed out. I was stressed, you know, being at home, um, all my work, like gone. Right. 
Um, but I decided, I'm like, what do kids do when they're in school? They have recess. I, mm-hmm. I was like, let me grab my hula hoop. And then Take I started the going, right. The energy changing the energy. But then I started getting all of these kids toys, like the skip ball, um, bubbles, roller skates, you know, um, uh, I got a bouncy ball, right. I, I, if I could be somewhere and just body roll down the hill. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I realize I can't do that too much because I get sick. You know, the older you get, I don't know what the equilibrium is. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But I would do all of those things. And it was just amazing. I And one day I decided to grab my suitcases. I'm not using them. I said, you guys, load your suitcases up. Act like you're going somewhere. This is the exercise. Go down the street. Come back. You have your suitcases. Like, you know, play. By the way, that is so smart. You just said bubbles. I'm like, where can I go buy bubbles? That would just change my mood if I could just blow some bubbles during the right? day. I, you know... I don't know if we understand how important it is just to do those type of things. I'm starting to realize, and I feel like there's just like so many messages I'm seeing. So people are stressed out. I know it's still the shut, not shut down, shut down, but people are still stressed the hell out. Yeah. And those little things can change your mood. Um, you, I go back, you then, you now have an audience. You have this great business. People love mm-hmm. you. They're coming to you. We're back to cooking. And <clears throat> as I clear my throat getting over a cold, no COVID. Um, you <laughs> create a business and correct me if I'm wrong, alchemy catering or catering? Yeah. Well, it it's started changed out now. Yeah, that's right. So it started out as the lunch basket because I literally put all that food in a basket. And when they're like, Oh, you have a business. What's the name of it? Cause I didn't plan anything. I look down, I see a basket. I'm like, Oh, it's a lunch basket. When are you coming back? I'm coming back tomorrow. You know, because I'm, I'm, I've been improv all my life. Um, so I, I changed it to, <clears throat> I changed it to alchemy caterers because, um, a friend had said, Carla, you need a pet, a plant or something. Um, so you should like go and adopt a pet. So I, I went to, uh, adopt a cat. I my life didn't support dogs, but I went to adopt a cat and I said, I'm going to name you alchemy because apparently you're going to change my life. Um, and, and I had just read the alchemist by Coelho. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I named my cat alchemy and then I named, I ended up naming my catering company alchemy because intuitively I felt like I knew what people wanted to eat. And I wanted, I wanted to charge that business with changing people by cooking with love for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. Now named though, we've, because it's official. You're like, why give that away? It's, uh, is it alchemy by Carla Hall or what is it? So then I changed, I changed my business to alchemy by Carla Hall. Okay. Um, because yes. you have a name and it's a platform and it makes it even more known. I love it. Exactly. I'm here for all that because it's the business of it now. Now we get the and, and what's so interesting when you say a name, you are activating what the name means. Mm-hmm. And so for me, that alchemy by Carla Hall changes. And now um, my my company is called um, Adventure Follows Limited because my six words of advice to anybody is say yes, adventure follows, then growth. Wait, say it again. Say yes, adventure follows, then growth. And so you think about those three parts of your life. So first of all, uh, if something comes to you, whether, whether it's an adventure or a lesson, you have to say yes to it. By saying yes to it, you go through it, you get to the other side of it, and you will grow from it. Yeah. 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 I love that say yes. And that's with anything, workship, relationship, mm-hmm. friendships, man. Um, too many downloads for me today to, to even process. I'm just taking it all in. I, I think that I fell in love with, you, love with you probably as America did. And I did not believe it or not. I wasn't, I didn't watch any of the food network shows. You had two seasons on top chef. I'm sorry. I did not watch mm-hmm. those, but I knew you from the chew. Um, and being a television personality myself, I liked, I was immediately drawn to you. You have this thing and you've heard it before that makes you just want to be your friend. And I want to hang out with you. I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're cooking. But I just want to hang out with you. <laughs> you know, I think I get that a lot. Um, I think it's because, um, I'm being real. When you watch somebody on television and I, and, and I have to say it all goes back to theater. 
um, it all goes back to me feeling comfortable in my skin. And that didn't mean that I didn't go through awkward stages of my twenties and, and, you know, I wasn't crazy at 30, you know, but every decade I become more of myself, um, mm. where the inside matches the outside. Yeah. And, and so I think that being in the moment, I can, I can be silly. I can be quirky. I don't feel like I have to be the cool chick. I don't have to be the bougie chick. I don't have to, yeah. I don't have to be, I don't have I to be the cool black girl. That. Yeah. I didn't sense any of that. Authenticity yeah. is a currency that people don't employ enough. And I think we're starting to realize that what, that is what works. Candidly, there was a time, I think I was watching the show and there was, you know, and that could have been me reading into it. This is the chew on ABC. It was on air from, I believe 2011 to 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, I mean, wildly popular and it made sense and it fit with all the daytime shows. And, and the thing about having a five day a week show, it's like, you're going to see, you're going to catch it eventually. If you don't know about it, you'll catch on to it. You'll see it. You'll be in the airport. You'll be at home. You'll be flipping through the, back at the doctor's office. TV. Yeah. Back when people watch <laughs> TV, right. But at the doctor's office and even, you know, like that's what it is. <clears throat> but I felt like I caught one of few times there was this awkward moment. You may have, not you, but there was something going on and a guest or a co-host might have been, there might have been an awkward moment. And and you handled it to me um, with so much grace and class when someone could have fell into their ego and didn't like it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you were just so dismissive of it. And it was such a lesson for me because at the time and probably even still now I would have, I would have responded with my ego and you didn't. And I was, I was impressed by that. And by the way, I didn't even know that's what you were doing, but I just liked that you didn't even let it phase you. And, um, and then I realized I was like, she wasn't even egocentric about it. Like, cause people on TV in any capacity, when they feel they're an expert and they have an audience and a, fl- a following and, and, and you listen to what people say on social media, you feel something about yourself if you're being, treated a certain way on television Mm -hmm. um and you were just very dismissive and i love that you're you're probably right there were many moments that i can recall where things like that happened and in the moment i i had a choice Mm -hmm. you know um if it was a guest i i always wanted them to feel welcome like you you have stepped into my house you know um so i will i will all i always want you to feel good here you know even if you left and I'm like, Oh my God, what the hell was that? They got right. (laughs) Right. But I would never, my duty as a host is to take care of you in my house. Yeah. And I would have always taken that. I would have always chosen that over my ego. What a beautiful way. What a beautiful way to describe that because it is your home and you're welcoming Mm -hmm. someone into your home, the audience, the guests, whomever feel comfortable. We're not here to make you feel bad. Um, right. I, I then you watch it, you watch the chew. You've all these, first of all, your look is totally different. You're beautiful. You're tall. You're very distinguished. It, it is, it is obvious to see who you are, right? Um, Mm -hmm. physically and personality wise. And I have to, I have to imagine when you did, um, Top Chef that you didn't think that that would turn into a, a TV gig on ABC Walk me through the process of being on that show and what was it like to be in front of the public and everyone knowing who you are and commenting on everything you do and how you made them, you know, the gumbo. And if they didn't like the gumbo and why you was fan favorite number five and number six, (laughs) number seven, (laughs) number eight. I don't watch Top Chef, y'all. Right. No, uh, we we know. We know. That's okay. (laughs) Um, so, you know, interestingly enough, um, and you, you said it, you said it earlier, you know, the universe speaks like when you're meant to do something like everything in the universe conspires to, to make that thing happen. Um, when it was in 2007 that, um, I actually filmed Top Chef and I remember my, um, I was out, it was a long day catering and, um, my sous chef came in the next day and she said, Oh, I had a dream. You were on top chef. I had just found out about the show. I, I started watching. Sorry, oh my God. I started watching top chef after season, uh, like season th- four. And when they were, when they were getting ready to cast for season five, um, I had a long, busy catering season. I literally binge watched, um, all of top chef, you know, how they, how they yeah. start playing all the shows. And then I started watching, um, the fourth um, season. So I go back in and my, my um, sous chef says, I had a dream you were on top chef. So that same day I get home and there was a call to, Oh, we're calling for magical elves. And I was just like, cause I have, I have jokesters as friends, you know? 
Um, so I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to return this call because they're, they're just setting me up. And, but I had it on my cell phone and my home phone. And so I called back and I was like, oh, hey, what's up? And then they're like, oh, we're calling from Magical Ales. I'm like, oh, you really are. And so it was just so <laughs> crazy because I was, and then it was, a, it was, I, I'm in an organization called Le Dame de Scoffier, which is a, um, a female organization of chefs and people in the hospitality business. And the president had recommended me. So I, because they didn't remember her name, I had no connection to who told them about me. When I applied, I went to this lady blind and said, hey, would you do write a, um, a, uh, a reference for me? She said, of course, because I gave them your name. Had no idea. Had no idea. I went back to her. I ended up going to CIA, upstate New York, for this interview. And I was getting ready to um, uh, go home. My phone was dying. I was at the train station. I was like, shoot. My phone is dying. Let me call my husband right now to tell him, look, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to call him. And I said, oh, I have a message. I'm at the train station. I listened to my message. Hi, Carla. This is uh, Magical Ales. We're calling back from the interview. Can you come back for a second interview? This is after I had my first interview. Right. I am 15 minutes from getting on the train to go home. They want you to come and back today, like right they now? They wanted me to come back that day. Oh, okay. I mean, can you imagine, though, no! on the train, getting the message, like, what? So Gotta get off. They exactly. love me. So everything about that experience was conspired for me to be on that show. Yeah. And at the time, mm. I was 44. A lot of people don't realize that I, I was one of the oldest um Chef no, because you, because black don't crack and you look amazing and your spirit is so young. You can't mm -hmm. even, I like, maybe because I look, I used to wear silver hair all the time. I'm like, yeah, okay. I like it. Yeah, you, no one would know. No one would know. And you say it yeah. so boldly and proudly in a world that tells you you're not supposed to. This is what I love about you too. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm always telling people, I mean, now I'm 58. I'm, I'm looking forward to 60. What the wisdom, even, even though impossible. Harry impossible. having my hair go gray, we said it's not possible. It is it's possible. Not possible. Look how good crack. you look. It, I, I, okay. Find a wrinkle, find something. I feel sorry for y'all who not got no melanin in y'all tone. Like I am sorry. <laughs> I am sorry y'all mad at us. I'm sorry we stay fine and we are well. Girl, could you fine? Go on. I'm sorry. Thank you, girl. Thank <laughs> you. You are fine. Thank you. But but no, it's um so so I'm going through all of that. When I am on Top Chef, because I was a caterer, because I was older, I was I was not taken seriously. Every time I would win and I'd come like, oh my God, I won. And they would look at me like, what the hell? And how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I felt that I'm very intuitive I felt that yeah. um a lot of times I felt like I was the odd person out mm -hmm. and I remember telling um my friend um Arian Duarte I said you know she was like oh my gosh I'm on the bottom and I said when you're on the top you get feedback from the judges when you're on the bottom you get feedback from the judges. When you're in the middle, you get nothing. So be grateful for the top or the bottom. Mm -hmm. you're because saying, you you're, get something out of that. Correct. Be grateful for the top or the bottom because you're going to get something out of it. When you just mediocre in life, nobody's paying attention. You right there in the middle. Right. Oh, boy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Again, writing this down, guys. Hope you guys are too. In my mind, mental note. So then you go on and they bring you back because you were a yeah. fan favorite, whether you were a fan favorite in their mind or not, they bring you back. They asked me three times to come back. And I said, no, my, um, my PR company at the time was saying, Carla, don't do it. You've been working hard to try to establish your own brand separate from the top chef brand. We suggest you don't do it. And they even said, what if you get kicked off first? Hmm. I'm, Too bad for me, it was like, wait, is that a like, challenge? I would have been like, that's not going to happen. Sorry. You got me You got me all the way effed up. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Right? No, but that was a <laughs> challenge. And it was yeah. at that point. So so that was a challenge. But, but you know, it needles in your head. And then sure. um, one of the producers said to me, 
Um, what if you made it part of your plan? Now, a lot of chefs go on because they have restaurants. They want to be, you know, sure. on the show. They, it's a publicity thing. It wasn't. It was never that for me. It was a personal challenge because I'm competitive. That's what I do. Um, so this time I didn't want to cater anymore. I had alchemy catering and I, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to cater anymore. And I said to him, I said, okay, because I wanted to get out of catering. In the meantime, I had a really toxic and bad, um, partnership that I, that I got into because I needed, um, I needed stability with the catering. I needed somebody sure. to help me with the infrastructure. Sure. So I said yes to a partnership that I shouldn't sure. have said yes to. Sure. Now I wanted to get out of it. Right. So all of that was happening. The thing that people don't realize when you do these shows and people know you and everybody's coming to your little spot to like get a piece of you, it changes how that business runs. When you're in a restaurant, it may, it may be different if it's a big restaurant. If it's a small restaurant, it generally ruins that restaurant. The number of people, what you can take on, how many people are standing in line, it changes the face of that restaurant. And that's what happened to my catering company. And so I really wanted to say, I don't cater anymore, okay? But I was like, what do I want to do? And that's when I said, you know what? I think I'm going to have a cookie company. And that's when I did um, um, Alchemy by Carla Hall. It was more cookies and desserts. I had these tiny cookies that were the size of sugar cubes. Um, but it was stupid because nobody knew they were cookies. So they still thought I catered. And I, so that, that, that wasn't thought out. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, so I was doing that. And then but it was I got, a plan to get you to the, the where you needed to be. Yeah, exactly. To the next thing. Again, mm -hmm. still on the bridge or back on mm -hmm. another bridge. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so so I did that. And then I got sort of to um, the 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 finale where there were many chefs, but I got kicked off. But then that was the show that they voted me as fan favorite. It's because mm -hmm. I was fan favorite. And this, and I want to go back and say, a lot of people will even tell me this now. They were like, you were robbed. You were robbed. Of course. I wasn't. But I wasn't. Because if I had won Top Chef in 08, I wouldn't have, whatever was it? Was it 08? Yeah. I wouldn't have been back on that show in 2011. Correct. 2011 was when they were looking for people from the Chew. Because I won Correct. fan favorite, uh -huh. I was um, on their mm -hmm. radar. Mm -hmm. And talk that's when the, I... Talk to the people about how everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. Absolutely. You may not even know it. You don't everything know. happens for a reason. But I also believe that every lesson has a name. So you see those people that you are angry with, you're angry with that person. Don't be angry at the person. It's the lesson that's going to teach you to get you to the next place. It is a lesson with a name. Every relationship you had, every job that didn't turn out, every time, boss that failed you, that you think failed you. If you would allow to accept that lesson, you will learn something for the next thing. If you don't, if you're in denial, you keep yourself in that place. Just saying. All of it. You're saying all the things. Yeah. Now I'm like, let me, how do I look at my ex-boyfriend? That is what the, and then my yes. ex -boyfriend. I'm all like, I'm about to give y'all all lessons. Because I know the lessons, but I got to give you like the lesson, the real lesson, what I've uh -huh. learned from that. That is so amazingly smart. Um, and it's also a beautiful way to to make peace with what did and did not happen in your life and that's and right allow, and, and allowing that to teach you more um i'm here for all i'm here for the learning and the journey so but i'm gonna tell you so tell when i got the chew so they didn't pick me initially so the the producers did not pick me there were five other people daphne oz was the only original member of the chew mm. the only original member they decided to come back after a year of testing that show and workshopping it they came back and they brought in for in 20 minutes it was it was daphne clinton michael and mario the five of us were together for only 20 minutes the next day they announced us as the cast that deal went fast they like, it, it was, it was crazy. The yeah. same day that's that they announced the chew was the same day that I had um, gone for a, um, my, my book, my first cookbook was being auctioned. So they were like, Oh my gosh, she's going to be on the chew. So that meant I got a, I got a good deal. Yay. Right. I mean, all of that came down to that one moment. It was amazing. Actually and it was six days later. Yeah. And you have several books. Um, you guys have to check them all out. I went on Amazon. I did all my full research. The latest, I believe, I love you. 
is a children's book. Well, yes. actually, Peyton did the research. Thank you, Peyton. Um, and then there's a children's book. Um, it's Carla and the Cornbread, Christmas Cornbread. Yeah, Carla and the Christmas Cornbread. Yes, and yes. And I love that the idea of because now it's time, right? You're an you're an author. Now it's time for the you know we have to talk about the Christmas Cornbread. Um, if if someone's looking to get that for their child, what is the what is the lesson? What is the lesson with that children's book? I think for this book, it's the power of, of intergenerational clicking together, a child clicking with a grandparent and caring, especially in the black community, in any community, you don't have to be black to understand this, this concept. To cook with a grandparent, that is how the stories and your culture are passed down from mm -hmm. generation to generation. So true. Having all of those stories and the sensory and taste, it is not the written recipes. It's the, the recipes that are stored in all of your senses. That is how your culture is, is passed down. And so um, I, I, lo I loved cornbread. My grandmother made the best cornbread for me, and she never made it until we were on the inside of the door. And just remembering all of that. But when I was working with... Um, the illustrator, Sharice, she, um, she's looking at the book and she's like, okay, I go to bed and she's like, Hey, can I ask you, um, did you wear for rollers in your hair before a big, like a holiday or something like, Oh my gosh. Yes. I did. Right. Roller in the bangs, roller in my like pigtails. And, and I'm bringing that up because this woman, um, she's from, um, Bermuda. And, um, but we share, we had that common thread as a, as a black woman and pulling out those threads. And she only has the manuscript. There are no pictures that she is creating these pictures and we're going back and forth. That is the power of yeah. culture yeah. and it is not to be underestimated. And let me tell you, there's nothing like bonding over culture. And again, this is for any culture. I could have a conversation. Well, one, I'm immediately connected when you say that. You say rollers. And I'm like, oh, yeah, my mom used to put a roller right here yeah. until I could figure out how to do my own hair and burn it out myself. Um, oh, my God. And then, and she, by, by the way, my mom still rolls her hair. I'm like, I don't know. My mother, my mother does too, girl. I'm all like, mom, how are you still rolling your hair? I don't even know what that, I'm like, the process is too much work. She had to part, roll, part, roll. I'm like. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, but um, the connection that you have transcends culture, yeah. right? Because everyone feels connected to you. Cooking is very powerful, but it's such, um, for me, it's so obvious to see that that is the, the conduit in which you have been given to reach people. But it's more about, I think, um, your spirit. Like you're a gift. You walk into a room, you sit down, you talk to people, you're a gift. And you give mm, that gift you. of whatever that can be. Cause I'm, I'm inspired not to cook, but just inspired by your personality. It lightened my day. You know oh, what I mean? And you. so when you, when you think of how God works for people, like I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna give you this talent, but it really is to give something else back. So that's wonderful. You know, when you say that, so when I got the chew and I was blown away, um, you know, here I am, I, I, I was on a competition show as a chef, um, and all of a sudden here I am thrown into a show on national television, um, about in one of the big networks. And I went to a friend and I said, what do I do with this? I mean, like, what do I do with this? And she said, um, your prayer every day should be authenticity mm -hmm. because that says more to the audience than anything. Um, and I knew that at that point, I also had to give back the responsibility of having this platform, which I think a lot of young people don't take seriously. They're like, well, that's not my child. I, I, I don't have anything to do with that child. But when you are on national television, the, that platform speaks volumes and it goes to places and you don't know where it goes. And so when people come up to me and said, my children really like you, um, my grandmother watched you every day. Uh, I was watching your show and we were in the hospital with mm -hmm. my grandmother. And that was the one thing that we did together. That set speaks volumes to me. And so I own that responsibility. 
Yeah. 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 So I, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you very yeah, much. You do. And you own it well. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So get the book guys. I'm going to, um, I'm going to Carla. I hate when I end with the question of what do you have next? Is there anything that we should be promoting? Cause I have been on, I'm all on your sites. You've been doing it. You, you have a partnership. I see most recently with Disney. Talk to me about all the ways in which we are making this bag get bigger and bigger. <laughs> Can I just tell you, Carrie, let me just tell you, my uh -huh. hustle muscle is very strong. No, okay. good. listen, you ain't got to time to, ha ha. Uh, yes. <laughs> I need streams on streams on streams of revenue, people. <laughs> so my hustle muscle is very strong. I'm working on a product line. I'll say more about that later. I'll have to come back. Um, mm. Um, I did, I, I was recently in Di at Disney to do something with Tiana and her merchandise line that just came out. It's amazing. Like this culinary merchandise line. Um, I'm my deal, my, um, my deal is with, um, discovery and food network. So you will see me on Halloween baking championship starting in September and then holiday baking championship. I'm getting ready to film, um, holiday baking championship, gingerbread edition. Mm -hmm. And then in January, I have a new show coming out called Chasing Flavor. And mm -hmm. and it is my dream show. It oh, I love that. Idea. I love that. I love that uh, title. Yes, yes. And it is a travel log show. And uh, not only am I the host, but I'm also an EP on it, which whoop, whoop. Um, yeah, that, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. All the things. And so, um, so that is really exciting. And the show is about taking a dish that is, is beloved by Americans. It's not necessarily quintessentially American, but it is beloved by Americans, but we take it to a, from a nuanced version and we trace it back on a path in history and, and, you know, food can go in different directions. So we choose a path so that we can give credit to the cultures who had a hand in that dish. Because a lot of times, you know, we remember the latest thing, but we don't know where that dish came from. And we sort of diss and erase all the cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Chasing flavor. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. What network? You said Disney. Discovery Plus. I mean, dis I mean, dis oh my God, just say like Disney. Sorry, Mickey. It's not you. Uh, yeah, it's um, not it you. Discovery. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Warner Discovery. What's the new name going to be? Warner Discovery HBO? What is it? I don't know, but I'm glad they at least they green light projects over there because they canceling everything. So I'm glad you got okay. your, your deal done because I was at CNN Plus with a whole show that they got rid of. <laughs> so yes. I understand. Yes. Okay. So with that being said, um, you are based where exactly? I am based Not in D.C. Okay, well, no, so I live I in D.C. I live okay. in I live in D.C. and um yeah, in, in the D, not the M, not the V, but in the D, but, I'm just saying, y'all. Okay. <laughs> How does that establish when I can come over and have dinner? Because that this is, I'm not. Are I'm you not here? Saying, Are no, you here? I, I live in LA, but I go to DC a lot. So for work. Oh my work, gosh, so you have to come. How is this like, so, this is a selfish ass. This isn't about, you know. So, okay, so I'm going to get your phone number when we get done recording because I don't want my, my folks to call you talking about what's that recipe to the mac and cheese and a cornbread. No, um, let me tell you. Okay, Carrie, first of all, it is my service to make biscuits with people. I do cornbread, ah! but it is my service. I, I, I would I, take I, a biscuit. I, will I, I would walk up to strangers and say, do you know how to make a biscuit in New York City and go to their homes? Like oh. I, I did it in San Francisco. I, I, I've, I've, I've helped restaurants make biscuits. I'm like, this biscuit is terrible. When can we get together? When, when, <laughs> when, uh, when can I come and teach y'all how to make biscuits? Because this right here ain't it. Um, so yes, I will host you. Uh, we just redid our house. So it's, it's yeah. welcoming and beautiful. And you yeah. can also see yeah. that, uh, my house on discovery. So, um, Oh, I love it. So let's do it. Let's do it from all angles. Come and catch me everywhere. Yeah. Oh, you are, you are in your, you are in your purpose and it is beautiful to see. And if anybody is listening as they are, you have to understand what it feels like to, and looks like to be in your purpose. That's why you look amazing, sound amazing. And the energy is great. Like that's, that is goals, right? Like yeah. that is the goal of life to be in your purpose and very, be very well aware of it. Wow. And I think the, uh, the last thing I'm going to say, but it's not static. So I didn't stop it and get upset with the two because I knew there was more life. Like uh, there's always a bridge between what you had done and what you eventually wanted to do, uh, yeah. what you eventually want to do. And one of the things I'm trying to get into voiceovers, I want to do acting. I want to come back to acting now because that's mm -hmm. where I started as it begins is mm -hmm. how it ends. 
That's what I want to do. I I'm a Gossip that. Girl. I'm, I'm going to be on Gossip Girl season oh, two. What? HBO Max? The one on HBO Max? Yes. Oh, girl. Okay. How do you forget that? <laughs> All right. I forgot. Sorry. Yes, it's coming Jesus, out in September. There's so, there's so much going on and so many blessings, guys. I just forget all the things that are happening. No, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I, love I know. It. I love and I'm it. doing I art. It. I love paper quilting. So I, I draw, I work with my hands. And so all of those things, I, I yeah, I'm just a creative and I, I do it in different ways. Or as you said, and we'll end with this, that hustle muscle is strong. 